Welcome to the Online School of Theology. I am Jonathan Exum, your teacher, or John Exum is on the screen. Uh, you can call me either or, uh, Jonathan or John. I'll go by either or. Uh, we're going to be learning the book of Genesis, and uh, we're going to be using Brother Bob Winton's commentary. Uh, it is trustworthy, and I love it. Excuse me. Let's go to our uh, notes here. Let's see what screen to use. All right. We are in Genesis. Let's zoom in a little bit. And of course, for the Bob Winton's commentary on Genesis. And so this first lesson is on the introduction to Genesis. And so the title of the book, the name Genesis, is the title given by the Greek Septuagint version of the Old Testament, which is the LXX. And it means origin or beginning. In the Hebrew version, it is called Bereshith, which means in the beginning. This name is derived from the first Hebrew word of Genesis 1.1. Leupold said the name universally used in English for this book is Genesis. This name is a transliteration of the Greek word genoius, which con constitutes the regular title from the form of old in the Septuagint and was taken over by Jerome into the Vulgate, Liber Gen Genesis. Luther made a new departure when he substituted in his German Bible the title of the first book of Moses, a designation requiring no further commentary. In the Hebrew Bible, the book constitutes the, uh, uh, constitutes the first part of the Pentateuch. As a distinct part, it so naturally stands out as a unit that there can be no doubt that it was designed to be just such a unit. They, the Jews, are wont to remember or to refer to the book by the title of Bereshith, the very first Hebrew word meaning in the beginning. Oh, I can't read. The name given this book is appropriate, for the book describes the beginning of all things material, the heavens and the earth, the animal, vegetable, and mineral kingdoms, mankind, and the human family. Also, the beginning of some spiritual concerns. You have sin. You have the condemnation for sin, the initial steps of the unfolding of the scheme of redemption. You have sacrifices and the Hebrew people. Now let's move on to the purpose of Genesis. It gives a brief survey of divine history from the beginning until Israel enters Egypt. The book is not intended to give a complete and detailed account of history, but rather a survey of significant events and people relating to God's plan to redeem man. It gives a record of the origin of the universe and the things and beings which inhabit it. Genesis furnishes the only dependable and accurate record of creation. Science cannot speak authoritatively on the creation. It addresses only the things it can measure with material means. No man was present to witness the creation. The Creator revealed to Moses the information we have regarding this divine operation. It begins to reveal the nature of God as Creator, Preserver, and Lawgiver. This information must be given progressively because of man's finite nature. It is primarily a book of religious history while dealing with human affairs. It shows how God deals with man. It was given for our learning and admonition. Consider Romans 15 and verse 4. For what sort of things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. The purpose of Genesis may be formulated thus. The book aims to relate how Israel was selected from among the nations of the world and became God's chosen people. Since, however, this choice was not made because of the merit or the excellence of Israel's ancestors, but wholly because of God's unmerited and unmeritable mercy. The book may also be said to be the story of God's free grace in establishing Israel for himself as his people. As for the author of Genesis, the Bible is a unit. Each part contributes to and helps sustain and substantiate the whole. To verify one part is to verify the whole. The five books which comprise the Pentateuch form a unit. To identify the writer of one of these books is to identify the writer of all five. The Pentateuch is the name of the first five books of the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. If it can be proved that Moses did not write the Pentateuch and that the Pentateuch is neither genuine nor authentic, 
the credibility of every other book of the Old Testament would be lost. Not only would the Old Testament books be seriously questioned, but even the words of our Savior would be rejected, for he had attributed the authorship of the Pentateuch to Moses. There is internal and external testimony and evidence which attribute the authorship to Moses. The book of Genesis does not set forth an express statement concerning the identity of the author. The circumstances that precisely give the information needed to make the book of Exodus intelligible is supplied by the book of Genesis. It is in Genesis that the promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are spelled out. Moreover, the fact that Exodus 1-1 begins with and, Hebrew, indicates that it was intended to follow some preceding book. The Pentateuch itself testifies that Moses was the author. And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book, and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua, Exodus 17, 14. And the Lord said unto Moses, Write thou these words, for after the tenor of these, things, these words, excuse me, I have made a covenant with thee and with Israel. These are the journeys of the children of Israel, which went forth out of the land of Egypt with their armies under the hand of Moses and Aaron. And Moses wrote their goings out according to their journeys by the commandment of the Lord. And these are their journeys according to their goings out. Number 33, 1, 2. Consider, <clears throat> consider Exodus 24, 3 through 8. And Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments. And all the people answered with one voice and said, all the words which the Lord hath said, we will do. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord and rose up early in the morning and built an altar under the hill, the twelve pillars and twelve pillars according to the twelve tribes of Israel. And he sent young men of the children of Israel, which offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of the oxen unto the Lord. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins, and half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar. And he took the book of the covenant and read it in the audience of the people. And they said, All that the Lord has said we will do and be obedient. And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold the blood of the covenant, which the Lord hath made with you concerning all these words. Deuteronomy 31, 9 through 11 says, And Moses wrote this law and delivered it unto the priests, the sons of Levi, which bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord, and unto all the elders of Israel. And Moses commanded them, saying, At the end of every seven years, and the solemnity of the year of release, and the Feast of Tabernacles, when all Israel is come to appear before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose, thou shalt read this law before all that, before all Israel in their hearing. Deuteronomy 31, 24-26 says, And it came to pass when Moses had made an end of writing the words of this law in a book, until they were finished, that Moses commanded the Levites, which bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord, saying, Take this book of the law and put it in the side of the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, that it may be there for a witness against thee. The antiquity of the laws in the Pentateuch suggests Mosaic authorship. These laws had been observed by Israel from the time before they entered Canaan. These laws had been handed down from generation to generation with the understanding that Moses was the author. Some of the laws given in the Pentateuch would have been dangerous to the Israelites without the divine protection of God. The Jewish males were commanded to gather for religious observances three times each year. The lawgiver assured them that they would have no reason to fear enemy attack while they were away from their families. Thrice in the year shall all your men and children appear before the Lord God, the God of Israel, for I will cast out the nation before thee, and enlarge thy borders, neither shall any man desire thy land. When thou shalt go up, go up to appear before the Lord thy God thrice in a year, Exodus 34, 23 and 24. Other Old Testament books give the evidence that Moses was the inspired penman of the Pentateuch, which includes Genesis. The whole of the historical portion from the book of Joshua down to Chronicles, Ezra and Nehemiah, in connection with the history of Joshua, the judges, and the kings, represents the Pentateuch as being Moses' book of the law. Joshua 1.8 says, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Joshua 11, 12 says, And all the cities of those kings, and all the kings of them that did Joshua take, and smote them with the edge of the sword, and he utterly destroyed them, as Moses the servant of the Lord commanded. Number 33, 1 and 2 says, These are the journeys of the children of Israel, which went forth out of the land of Egypt with their armies under the hand of Moses and Aaron. 
And Moses wrote their goings out according to their journeys by the commandment of the Lord. And these are their journeys according to their goings out. Deuteronomy 31, 9 to 11 again. And Moses wrote this law and delivered it unto the priests of the sons of Levi, which bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord. And unto all the elders of Israel. And Moses commanded them, saying, At the end of every seven years, in the solemnity of the year of release, in the Feast of Tabernacles, when all Israel has come to appear before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose, Thou shalt read this law before all Israel in their hearing. Judges 3 verses 1 through 4 says, Now these are the nations which the Lord left to prove Israel by them, even as many of Israel as had not known all the wars of Canaan, only that the generations of the children of Israel might know to teach them war, at the least such as before knew nothing thereof, namely, five lords of the Philistines and all the Canaanites and the Sidonians, and the Hivites that dwelt in the Mount in Mount Lebanon, from Mount Baal Hermon, unto the entering in of Hamath. And they were to prove Israel by them to know whether they would hearken unto the commandments of the Lord, which he commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses hand of Moses. First Kings two three, and keep the charge of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes and his commandments and his judgments and his testimonies, as is written in the law of Moses that thou mayest prosper in all that thou doest, and whithersoever thou turnest thyself. First Chronicles 22, 12-13, Only the Lord give thee wisdom and understanding, and give thee charge concerning Israel, that thou mayest keep the law of the Lord thy God. Then shalt thou prosper if thou take heed, takest heed to fulfill the statutes and judgments which the Lord charged Moses with concerning Israel. Be strong and of good courage, dread not, nor be dismayed. Second Chronicles 8, 12-13 says, and Solomon offered, offering according to the commandment of Moses, on the Sabbaths and on the new moons, and on the solemn feast three times in the year, even the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the Feast of Weeks, and the Feast of Tabernacles. So you, you see the pair of the um, consistency in these verses about how they were to keep the law, and how they would be teaching these things, and and they should not turn from the law. They should not turn from learning these things. And that's a lesson we can learn from about God's word, is that we shouldn't turn from God's word at all. The testimony of Christ affirms, uh, affirms. Let's try again. The testimony of Christ affirms Moses as the human instrument in writing the Pentateuch, again, which includes Genesis. Consider what Jesus said in Matthew 8, 4. And Jesus said unto them, See that thou tell no man, but go thy way, show thyself to the priest, and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a testimony to them. Compare this. And the priest shall go forth out of the camp, and the priest shall look, and behold, if the plague of leprosy be healed in the leper, then shall the priest command to take for him, that is, to be cleansed, two birds alive and clean, and cedar wood, and scarlet, and hyssop. And on the eighth day he shall take two he lambs without blemish, and one new lamb the first year without blemish, and three tenths deal of fine flour for a meal offering, mingled with oil, and one log of oil. What Jesus had commanded that man to do was to do exactly as Moses had commanded in the law. Therefore, Jesus has given authorship to the Pentateuch, has been written by Moses. Therefore, the Pentateuch being inspired. Matthew 19, 78, when Jesus is talking about divorce, he says, they said, uh, they said to them, why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? Of course, they're referring back to Deuteronomy 24. He said unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives, but from the beginning was not so. Now here's what Deuteronomy 24 says. When a man had taken a wife and married her, and it comes to pass that she find no favor in his eyes, because he hath found some uncleanness in her. That's the key of, the, of Deuteronomy 24. Uncleanness is similar to what Jesus had said. Then let him write of her a bill of divorcement and give it in her hand and send her out of his house. So Jesus led, led, led credence to Moses as the human instrument in writing the Pentateuch. Again, Matthew 22, 24, saying, Master Moses said, If a man die having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up seed unto his brothers. Christ accepted this fact, if brethren dwell together, and one of them die, and have no child, the wife of the dead shall not marry without unto a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go in unto her, and take her to him to wife, and perform the duty of a husband's brother unto her, in Deuteronomy 25, 5. 
And of course, there's other passages that, sh that show Moses' uh, authorship, but we don't have time to go through all of these. The testimony of New Testament writers attest the Mos Mosaic authorship of Genesis, considered the book of Acts in Acts 3.22. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall, love, uh, shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall you hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. Of course, that's quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 18. And talking about the prophet being Jesus, Acts 7 11, uh, 6 11. I don't know why I said 7 11. I guess I'm thinking about working things or something. I don't know. Acts 6 11. Then they said, Suborn men, uh, suborn men, which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words. I think that should be summoned men, which said, but anyway. We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And in verse 14, we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. Again, attesting to Mosaic authorship. Acts 13, 39, and by him all that believe are justified from all things, from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. Again, the Pentateuch. Romans 3, 2, much every way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. And we can continue on and on and on throughout these scriptures that, that, that over and over again, these writers of the New Testament would give credence to the Mosaic authorship of Genesis and, and the rest of the Pentateuch. Philo, an Egyptian Jew of the first century, affirmed Mosaic authorship. Josephus did also. The language, style, and manner of writing used to argue for the genuineness. The character of the contents argues likewise. The interrogated Moses and other inspired writers and the Lord affirm Mosaic authorship. The natural manner of writing indicates Moses, the leader of Israel during the events accounted in much of the Pentateuch, was the writer. There has been no valid evidence offered by critics which disprove Mosaic authorship of Genesis and the Pentateuch, for that matter. The author shows a thorough acquaintance with many matters pertaining to Egypt. He was familiar with many Egyptian names, such as that of An, the native name for Heliopolis. Moses had the background for such knowledge. He was born, reared, and educated in Egypt. He had the opportunity and time to write the Pentateuch during the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. Here's a note here. The inspiration does not require that the writer have personal knowledge of the information he is recording. Indeed, all the material would require inspiration for that data to be absolute and correct. There was a great incentive for Moses to write the books. His people were about to enter Palestine. They needed the information he recorded since Israel was about to become a full-fledged nation. This nation was founded upon the moral and religious precepts which are recorded in the first five books of the Old Testament. It should always be remembered that Moses was merely the human instrument through whom God chose to reveal the information recorded. The stories he recorded, the commands he spoke, and the precepts he uttered all came from the Lord. The emphasis should not be placed on the human author, but upon the fact of his inspiration and the text itself. Let us consider the unity of Genesis. The book is skillfully organized and shows amazing unity. It is constructed around ten great generations. The generation of the heavens and the earth, the generation of Adam, the generation of the sons of Noah, the generation of the sons of Shem, the generations of Terah, the generation of Ishmael, the generation of Isaac, the generation of Esau, and the generation of Jacob. The unity of Genesis is exhibited in variable, invariable purpose. Yeah. The unity of Genesis is exhibited in the invariable purpose which runs through every line of it, not a line. A paragraph or chapter of it is misplaced. Straight as an error to the mark, every line of Genesis bears upon the ushering in of the seed singular promise to Eve before expulsion from Eden and finally culminating in the birth of the Son of God, as Kaufman on his commentary on Genesis. Genesis is perfectly united with the rest of the Bible. Paradise is lost in Genesis. It is regained in Revelation. In other words, it can be said this way. This is not in the, in the notes here, but it's the book of the Bible begins with life. And in the, the Bible, you have life. So it's from life to life. And in between there is, is God's plan on how to win life back for man, and that is through Jesus. The twelve patriarchs of the Old Testament have their New Testament counterparts in the twelve apostles. There are types and shadows in Genesis which have divine realities in the New Testament. Consider Kaufman's notes here. 
Only God could have constructed such a unity line bit by bit through 16 centuries of time with 40 different writers from all times, occupations, and races of men. In the broad view, Genesis and the whole Bible reveal a single purpose, that of redeeming fallen man from the curse of sin. Now let's look at the interpretation and relevance of Genesis. Exegesis, ex means out, and Jesus to take from, to take out from, Exegesis is to take from a verse only what God put in it. Once a person starts interpreting the Bible to fit current human theories, he must continually change his interpretations. Theories change, but God's word remains constant. Psalm 119.89, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. And an earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away, Jesus said in Matthew 24. John 10.35, If he called them gods, unto whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken. Prejudices called me, calls men to reject Genesis' account of creation. Some are anti-supernatural, but if one rejects the supernatural in Genesis 1 and 2, he must rule out all other accounts of supernatural events in the Bible. To do that would rob the scriptures of their power, remove God from human history, and deprive us of the Savior. Some are materialistic. To these there is no God. The universe made itself. Man came into being purely by chance. We must be willing to enter the study with an open mind. The New Testament and other parts of the Bible will shed much light on Genesis, and it will shed light on these other scriptures. For what sort of things are written for time are written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Again, Romans 15, verse 4. The relevancy of Genesis to modern man is seen in the following. The seed of woman is promised, Genesis 3, 15. And then as realized, Galatians 4, 4, when the fullness of time come and the right moment at the right time, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. You see the sacrifice of Christ pictured in Genesis 4, 4. As Abel and Abel, he brought of the first things of his flock and the fat thereof, and the Lord had respect to Abel and to his offering. And then, of course, you have John's statement, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. Then you have the seed of, seed of Abraham, Genesis 22, 18. And it's realized in Galatians 3, 16. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. And the punishment of Noah's generation and of the Sodomite serves as a warning of the wrath to be shown in the wicked at the last day. Consider 2 Peter 3, 6 and 7, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Consider Jude 7, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Abraham's paying ties to Melchizedek showed beforehand the superiority of Christianity over the Mosaic system. Of course, Hebrews chapter 7 shows that in the, the uh, Melchizedek scene of Genesis chapter 14. Sarah and Hagar were types of the two covenants. Isaac was a type of Christ. Shiloh, Christ, was promised to come to Judah. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Hebrews 7, 14, For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah. It's exactly what Genesis says, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. The priesthood would be out of Levites, under the old law. Is a Genesis account of creation fact or myth? The common definition of a myth is a story of imagination which is not true. The classical definition of myth is a story told to enshrine absolute truth which could not be communicated to man otherwise. This type of myth always carries with it a moral. What could be the moral of Genesis 1 to 11 if that passage is myth? Genesis states facts. It contains non-scientific language but states facts of science. It is a revelation having a religious and spiritual aim. It shows the relation between man and God. The creation account is in order to faith, Hebrews 11, 1 through 6, Romans 10, 17. If this account is not true, then our faith is based on a falsehood. But to show man that he is the crown of creation is to lift man up and show him he is above the animals and that he has certain responsibilities toward God and his fellow man. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And of course, you have the the, the verses in Hebrews 11, 1 through 6 there. It was mentioned in the passage. Leupold said the issue 
involved briefly stated is, have we, his, have we history or legend in Genesis? A notable array of famous scholars can be cited in support of what the great majority of writers on the subject in our day regard as the only tenable view, namely Genesis as legend. From, from Valhausen down to outstanding names are Gunkel, Jeremiah, Driver, Skinner, Proxt, etc. However, we are not impressed by this array of learning, which we must without reservation class as pseudoscience on the matters of this sort. Strong dogmatic, strong dogmatic presuppositions are too definitely displayed by these scholars. Miracles are considered as practically impossible. So is plenary inspiration. Israel's history can rise to no higher levels than the Babylonian or the Egyptian. An arbitrary evolutionary standard is to be employed in measuring historical evidence. Besides, the following facts of Israel are overlooked. The utter dissimilarity of the Genesis record in the legends of the nations, the sober common sense of average Christians has always been able to detect this difference much more clearly than the overtrained scholar, who often loses entirely a sense of perspective. B, the clear distinction preserved by Israel's sacred records of the successive stages of revelation. The accuracy of Israel's historical tradition. And you see the scriptures that are mentioned, we'll, go, we'll discuss further when we get there. Distinct efforts by the patriarchs to perpetuate the remembrance of events of outstanding religious importance. The sober tone displayed in recording the most exalted revelation and consider the utter impartiality displayed in recording the history of those who are the patriarchs and the fathers of the tribes gives additional material on the score. Or, uh, I thought that was part of that. Uh, they see that commentary and gives additional information there. A proper evaluation of the facts enumerated above leads definitely to the conclusion that Genesis gives a sober, accurate, historical account of the events that led to the separation of Israel from among the nations and to her establishment as a new nation with a divinely given destiny. If the other nations of this period are known to have no records that for accuracy and sound historical pragmatism can begin to compare with the biblical accounts that cannot in any wise impugn the singular merit of the latter. Criticism has shown itself singularly weak in the direction of evaluating comparatively the merit of biblical history. Attempts to cut everything of superior merit found in Israel's sacred writings down to the level of contemporary literature is still the bane of scholarship in the Old Testament field. Consider this note by Leupold. In a general way, it would be correct to say that this book is singular in its kind, for it offers the only correct and satisfactory information that we possess concerning prehistoric times and I can't say that word, history of the Permit of Ages. It goes back beyond the reach of available historical sources and offers not mythical suppositions, not poetical fancies, not vague suggestions, but a positive record of things as they actually transpired and at the same time of matters of infinite moment, infinite moment for all mankind. But more specifically, all this material relative to prehistoric times and the urge, whatever it is, really provides the most substantial and even fundamental theological concepts. The major theological concepts are incomplete and leave much to be desired if the content that Genesis offers should be subtracted. Before God can be known as Savior, he must be understood as the creator of humankind and of the world. Just what manner of father and creator he is, he, he is we find, or he is, we find this displayed in two creation chapters, Genesis 1 and 2. In like manner, no adequate and correct conception of man is possible without a knowledge of the essentials concerning his creation, his original state, the image of God, and the like. Again, the problem of sin will constitute much more of a problem if the origin of sin, that is to say, the fall into, into sin, be not understood. With that, with that fact correctly apprehended, we achieve a correct estimate of the degree of depravity that is characteristic of fallen man. Of course, Calvinists would say that we inherit sin. That's not absolutely not true. Ezekiel 18, verse 20. And it goes on to say about the promise of victory that's, that's through the seed of woman, which is Christ. Consider the days of Genesis 1. A biblical statement or word is to be taken as literal unless there is something in the context which demands that it is taken as a figure of speech. There is nothing in the local or general context 
which indicates these days are not literal days. The days are equally divided between light and darkness. Plants were created on the third day. If the days were long geological periods, these plants would have died due to extremely long and cold nights. The deep cold would be caused by the absence of sunlight for that long period of darkness. Also, many plants depend on insects to propagate, but insects were not created until the sixth day. Even if these days were only a few years in length, this plant life would have perished. The word day is translated from the Hebrew yom. This Hebrew word is used figuratively to refer to longer periods of time than the literal 24 hour day in many instances. However, in all instances, the word is used with a numerical value, except in prophetic passages. It always has a reference to a literal solar day. In Genesis 1, the numeric values of first, second, etc. are used. There are more than 100 such uses, usage, such usages in the Old Testament. Moreover, when the plural form of yom is used, it always refers to 24-hour days. There are more than 700 use, such usages of the word in the Old Testament. In the context, the seventh day is not distinguished from the other six days in length. We have no reason to believe it was any longer or shorter than the others. Consider Exodus 20 verse 11. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them, in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Adam and Eve were created on the sixth day as the days were long geological periods of length. Modernists claim that Adam was extremely old before day number six ended. He lived through, through part of day six, through all of day seven, and for the rest of his 930 years. If these days were long eons of time, Adam would have been far older than the age assigned him. Many are unwilling to give up their day age interpretation of Genesis 1, and so have been driven to assert that Adam was not a real person. But New Testament passages clearly affirm that Adam was a real man and the first man, Matthew 19, 4, which talks about how God made them male and female at the beginning. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die. And of course, that's 1 Corinthians 15. The Hebrew word yom is used and defined in Genesis 1 and 5. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. As added proof, the word is clearly defined the first time it is used. God defines his terms. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. In the evening and the morning were the first day. Yom is defined here as the light period in regular succession of light and darkness, which, as the earth rotates on its axis, has continued ever since. This definition obviously precludes any possible interpretation as a geological age or geologic age. God plainly said the evening and morning were the first day. Genesis 1.14 says that the sun and moon were to divide the day from the night, and they were to be for signs, seasons, days, and for years. If the days were ages, then what are the years? What is the night? Had Moses wanted us to understand that these days are actually long geological periods of time, he could have used words so specific, specified to this point, but he did not. He could have used the Hebrew word olam with the word door, both of which would indicate indefinite periods of time. He could have modified the Hebrew yom by the adjective rab, yom rab, a long day. But again, he did not. As one author has correctly pointed out, if God said that he created everything in six days, but really used six eons, wouldn't that make God a deceptive, tricky, sneaky, deceitful God? And that's a good point. Now consider the date Genesis was written, about 1440 to 1400 B.C. And it came to pass in the 480th year, after the children of Israel were come out of the land of Egypt, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, in the month Zith, which is the second month that he began to build the house of the Lord. Now, the date of Moses' birth was placed by Unger at about 1520. This was well after the Hiskos rule, the king's favorable to Joseph, during which time a king arose who knew not Joseph. The ensuing hatred and oppression of the Israelites resulted in the adoption of Moses into the royal family. Also, Moses lived 120 years, and that brings us down exactly to the year 1400 B.C. The archaeological research of Professor John Garstang makes out a very strong case for the fall of Jer Jericho about 1400 B.C. Remember, Jericho fell to Joshua and his army shortly after the death of Moses. Egyptian history fits in with a 14, 
48 of Exodus, for there is testimony upon Egyptian monuments that showed Thutmose, the, I don't know what Roman numeral that is, not to have been the eldest son of Amenhotep the second, leading the likelihood that his firstborn perished in the Passover. There's alleged anachronisms in Genesis, and of course you can see this in Brother Kaufman's commentary. Acronism, the representation of something as existing or occurring at other than its proper time, especially earlier, or anything that is or seems to be out of its proper time in history. Genesis 12, 6. And Abram passed through the land unto the place of Sychem, uh, unto the plain of Morah. And the Canaanite was then in the land. What is meant is that Abraham left his native land to go to the land God would show him when he arrived. He found it populated by the Canaanites. They were already there. Genesis 36, 31. And those, these are the kings that reigned in the land of Edom before they, there reigned any king over the children of Israel. A list of Edomite kings is given which ruled before there was a king in Israel. This is said to prove that Genesis was written after Israel had kings. But Genesis 17, 6 and verse 16 is a background for the statement. Abraham was told that there would be kings among his descendants. And I'll make thee exceeding fruitful, and I'll make nation of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. And I will bless her, and give thee a son also of her. Yea, I'll bless her, and she shall be a mother of the nations. Of nations, kings of people shall be of her. Genesis 17, 6 and 16. Genesis 1, 3, 2 says, And Sarah died, and, and it was now, and cured Jeth Arba, the same as Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham came to mourn for Sarah, and to weep for her. Hebron is mentioned as the same as Kirjath Arba, which is alleged to indicate a late date. But Hebron was the ancient name of the place long before it was called Kirjath Arba. Moses identified it with its original name, not with its being called Hebron at a later time. In fact, the reason that the Israelites changed the name at a later time is probably due to what Moses wrote here. And in our next lesson, we will begin Genesis chapter 1. And I hope that this um, session you have learned a lot. And until the next video, we hope that you continue your studies. And thank you.